Well, first and foremost, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, you know, uh, main thing I want to share with everybody is just how grateful I am uh, to be back at the University of South Carolina, um, serving this great program, uh, serving the coaching staff here, um, and uh, serving the players. Uh, it's just uh, just a, just a lot of gratitude on my part to be in this position and excited to get started. Sounds good. With that, we'll open up the questions. Uh... Please raise your hand if you have a question. We'll start with David Kleinger from the Post and Courier. How's it going, Monty? Welcome back. Thank you, David. Good to be back. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, have you decided if you're going to wear the number 43 like you were the last time or maybe an 18? And then just how did this process start? Uh, when did you maybe first talk to Mark or Mark first reach out to you? Yeah, as far as the number, that's yet to be determined. Um, I'm not a big number guy, quite honestly. Whatever jersey they give me will be just fine. I picked 43 uh, when I came here in the fall of 2002 because I was a volunteer assistant, and that was like one of the only jersey numbers they had left, you know. So when you're when you're when you're the volunteer, you kind of take what you can get. Um, but um, you know, I, honestly, I don't know about the number. Um, and it's, and it's certainly not a priority. I'm a big believer the players should get the numbers first, and then we, we as coaches just take whatever is left. Um, as far as how the process started, uh, it happened it happened very uh, quickly. Um, you know, Mark uh, contacted me once uh, uh, Coach Kaye's uh, situation uh, began to uh, kind of unfold where it looked like um, he was going to be moving back with his family. Um, and, and stepping down from his position, Mark reached out to me and, um, you know, made it clear uh, that, that he wanted me to come to Columbia and, and, and work for him. And uh, I was just super excited about the opportunity. Um, it happened very, very fast. I will tell you that. Um, but it was a no brainer situation for me uh, just to be able to come back and work for Mark. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it didn't take long. Uh, for me to know, uh, just talking to Mark, just based on his excitement about the potential uh, of me coming back, uh, just how it made me feel. Um, you know, I was just very, very grateful that that he called and and really wanted me to come and work for him and 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 help him with the program. And um, you know, it was it was an easy yes for me. Next question to Colin Taylor from Gamecock Central. Hey, Monty, I hope you're doing well. Um, just a quick question. You obviously come in at a, an odder time coming to right as school starting and players are getting back on campus. What what do the next few weeks look like for you in trying to learn these guys, what makes them tick, and, and how to kind of help them with their games? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think my main priority is to get to know the, the people in the room first. I think that's very, very important uh, for the players to gain trust in me. Uh, they have to know me first. And, and look, they don't care how much I know until they know how much I care. I think that's the main objective for me right now is being in the role that I'm that I am in. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I'm here to serve to lead. I think that's really, really important for me early on is to show the players that I'm here to lead them by serving them first. Uh, so just getting to know them uh, individually, where they're from, uh, their strengths, their weaknesses, how I can help them. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, on the flip side of that, for them to get to know me, um, it's certainly going to be an adjustment. Um, I'm certainly going to show them things uh, in the cages out on the field uh, that may be a little bit different in terms of what they've been taught in the past. A lot of it, I hope, is, is some, of the, some of the things they've already heard and are already familiar with. Um, but uh, you know, we know it's going to be an adjustment, but the main priority is just to develop that relationship with the players and, and get into a good comfort zone and understanding of, of what we want to try to create and what we want to try to do here in the fall. All right, next question to Michael and Anna from the state. Hey, Monty, uh, welcome back. Um, I, I know, uh, obviously, you've been, uh, you know, the last several years, you've been a, a head coach, and, and I'm sure there's probably a, you know, a degree of pride that that comes with that. And I'm sure you've had, you know, as you're looking at this offseason, I'm sure you had plenty of opportunities head coaching wise, I guess, was there any reservations or any weirdness or just, I guess, how does it feel, I guess, sort of to to go from that to, you know, now working for Mark and, and you know, being his associate head coach? Yeah, I, I think it's very, very important that what I believe, if I want the players to believe in something, I have to believe in it too, right? 
And, you know, we're going to be really, really big on the players being selfless and putting the program first and dominating their role. I think that's very, very important. Look, if you want to play at a national championship level, you have to be willing to sacrifice for your for the program, be selfless, and dominate your role. And look, I have no problem whatsoever doing everything that I can to dominate the role that I'm in. That's what I did as an assistant coach for eight years. Look, I was an assistant coach for eight years before I became a head coach. And my, my sole mission as an assistant coach was to dominate the role that I was in as an assistant coach. The title does not necessarily matter to me. I'll be quite honest with you. Um, you know, my motivation is, is not to, uh, to do a good job uh, as an assistant coach, associate head coach, whatever the title is, uh, hitting coach, base running, outfield, recruiting. Um, it's not to, to do well in that role to be a head coach again. My job is to do the very best job I can for the University of South Carolina baseball program to recruit the best players I can to develop the players that we have here and to help Mark Kingston get to Omaha and win a national championship. That is my role, and I'm going to do everything I can to dominate that role um, and put this program first. It is not about me. This is about the players. This is about the head coach and helping all of the people in the building succeed at a high level. Next question is Scott Eisberg. Hey, Molly, uh, congratulations on the new gig. Hope you are well. Uh, just uh, wondering, first of all, um, were you absolutely set on coaching this year or were you willing to sit out this year to get the gig that you wanted? Uh, did, did you, was it, how much of a preference was it to stay in the state of South Carolina? And then with that, you know, obviously once you took the South Carolina gig, how quickly did you think about, oh, we've got a rivalry series against Clemson? <laughs> Those are all really good questions. I, I would say I absolutely did not want to sit out and I was not planning on sitting out this year. Um, my, my, my plan uh, was uh, to go into professional baseball um, unless a no brainer situation came about on the college side that I felt like, um, you know, was something that I really, really was excited about and wanted to do. I, I made a promise to myself, Scott, uh, when when everything happened, um, you know, right there at the beginning of June um, and I was let go from Clemson, I made a promise to myself that um, the only way that I was going to take a college job and, and I had some opportunities uh, was if it was something that absolutely 100 percent excited me and uh, was something that I that I really felt like I that I really wanted to do and be a part of. Um, and if I did not find that opportunity, then I would go into professional baseball uh, trying to trying to sharpen my knife, so to speak, and, and learn, uh, you know, from from different people in the game and, and become better um, on the player development side and and, and those types of things. And, and then, uh, you know, looking uh, look, you know, next year, a couple years down the road and until that great opportunity that really excited me in college baseball came about. Uh, so, uh, you know, that was my plan. Uh, and, and look, I was, I was dead set on, on going into professional baseball, was certainly excited about the opportunity that I had um, and uh, until this came about. And this was one of those situations that really excited me. Uh, and I felt like this is just an opportunity that, that I will not turn down and I cannot turn down. And, and uh, you know, I told Mark that, uh, you know, when he called me. And as far as the rivalry, uh, you know, look, I, my focus is very, very uh, simple right now, and that is to help our players get better and get ready for fall practice and develop the type of winning culture that we need to compete at a high level. Um, I'm certainly not focused on the rivalry uh, right now, but look, I know it's going to come up, uh, but it's certainly not, a, you know, not a focus of mine right now. Next question, go to Emily Adams from the Greenville News. Hey, Coach, hope you're doing well. Um, how involved in your past positions have you been with, you know, all of the recruiting side of things? And what will be new about this job specifically as the recruiting coordinator for you? Well, I was, Emily, I was very, very fortunate um, as a volunteer assistant here at South Carolina to work uh, under a mastermind in recruiting in Jim Tolman. Uh, so um, I got a, I got a, a great uh, apprenticeship uh, under him of watching him do what 
what he did as a recruiter, and then watching how he tied in all of us on the coaching staff into that uh, plan. Uh, you know, got got a chance to to see Ray Tanner in the room with recruits selling the deal. Uh, got a chance to do the campus tours with Jim anytime we brought a recruit on campus and into the weight room and to the football stadium and the baseball facility and on campus and all of that. So. I had a really good feel uh, when I transitioned from uh, the volunteer assistant into the recruiting coordinator uh, for Coach Tanner. Um, you know, when, when Jim left to go to Liberty to be a head coach at Liberty, I had a really good feel of how to transition into recruiting coordinator. Uh, so as a head coach, um, I was very, very active. Um, I think most people in the business will, would, would tell you that um, I was out a lot. Uh, recruiting in person, going to evaluate and watch kids play. Um, I was very active uh, in recruiting for 14 years uh, as a head coach. So it's certainly a transition going back to recruiting coordinator, uh, just with the amount of phone calls and, and, uh, and, and things of that nature. But it's one that I'm very, very excited about and, and love getting out on the road and finding talent and communicating with families and and, and talking to people and again, just trying to, you know, to maximize our roster. I think we all know, um, you know, coaching is overrated. If you got really good players, uh, you got to have good players if you want to be successful. So I'm excited about the challenge and the transition of going back to recruiting coordinator. Next question to Rick Henry, WIS. Hey, Monty, good to see you again and welcome back to Columbia. Thank you, Rick. You know, we're all shaped by our experiences, both good and bad, good lessons, tough lessons. What are some of the experiences you've had as a head coach that have helped to shape your philosophy uh, towards coaching now and your approach? That's a great question, Rick. I, I would say that I'm, I'm certainly more calm, cool, and collected now than I was when I first began. Um, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in that you have to work uh, hard before you learn how to work smart. You know, the old saying, you know, I'd rather work smart than work hard. I don't believe in that. I think you learn how to work smart because you worked hard. Um, and, and I've made a lot of mistakes by being aggressive and working really hard uh, when it comes to coaching and when it comes to recruiting. I think that you learn by making mistakes. Um, and, and as a young coach, uh, as a young assistant, uh, and as a young head coach, I was very, very aggressive uh, when it came to coaching and when it came to recruiting. And uh, I think that over the course of time, you learn what works and what doesn't work for you individually, and you begin to learn how to work a little bit smarter. Uh, so I would think that's the main thing is, is being able to use 14 years of experience as a head coach. Uh, 22 uh, years total uh, as a coach, you know, try to help him when it comes to lineup decisions, in-game adjustments, uh, bullpen decisions, uh, just practice decisions, uh, communication with the players, anything that I can help him with, I'm going to help him with. And, and maybe even more importantly, what can I take off of his plate? Uh, because as the head coach, uh, as you guys know, you have to wear many different hats and in this role as an, uh, as an assistant coach, recruiting coordinator, um, you know, I don't have to wear as many hats as the head coach. I can concentrate on developing the players here and recruiting. Uh, so if there's things that Mark needs me to do to take off his plate, I can do that because I have the experience of being a head coach. And uh, I think that's, that's, you know, hopefully answers the question in regards to, uh, you know, my uh, philosophy now uh, versus, you know, maybe over past years or the experiences that I have had uh, over time is, you know, hopefully I'm working a little smarter uh, now just because of the experiences that I've had. Next question to Pete Iacobelli. Uh, hey, Monty. Um, I know you, you're not thinking about the rivalry, but you're in a unique position now as – in, in, in your what you've done going forward, how much weight did you give in considering whether to take that position? And what kind of a relationship did you and Mark have these past few years when you were going against each other? Mark and I had a great relationship because we both, uh, being uh, opposing head coaches uh, in the rivalry, you know, we share very similar perspectives. And, and, and I think that, you know, he and I, you know, throughout the course of, 
uh, of the years uh, would contact each other during the spring just to check in on each other. Um, so uh, it was a very healthy relationship and, and, and a friendship, uh, you know, that had um, kind of developed organically, you know, over the years. Um, you know, we really didn't know each other until he got to South Carolina. And then just with the rivalry um, and just being in the same state, uh, our stabs, uh, you know, being out on the road together, we began to develop some relationships and a mutual mutual respect for each other. Uh, but we got to know each other and would touch base, you know, maybe once a month throughout the season just to check in on each other and see how we were doing. Uh, so we, we had a really good uh, relationship. And, you know, as far as um, the awkwardness of the rivalry, the fact that, you know, I was the head coach at Clemson for seven years. Look, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that the kids that are in that program, uh, many of them outside of uh, the additions by the transfer portal, uh, that they made, um, you know, over the summer months. A lot of the kids in the program are kids that I recruited and that I coached. And look, I love those kids dearly, and I'm not going to shy away from that. Uh, you know, nothing's going to change how I feel about the players I coach, whether it was as an assistant at South Carolina, as a head coach at the College of Charleston, a head coach at Clemson, and now an assistant coach at South Carolina. Uh, you know, the jersey that we wear um, is, is never going to change how I feel about them as people. And, and I hope they feel the same way. You know, hopefully the fact that I'm at the rivalry school now, you know, does it change how they feel about me? Look, I know it's going to be different that weekend. You know, we're going to do everything we can uh, to beat them and they're going to do everything they can to beat us. And that's the beauty of competition. It's also the beauty of a rivalry that's unique to the state of South Carolina. Uh, you know, one of one of the, the the points that I learned from from Coach Tanner many, many years ago is there's no pro sports in South Carolina. You know, there is no Yankees and Red Sox uh, in the state of South Carolina. We are the Yankees and the Red Sox. So, uh, you know, the rivalry is 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 a very, very good one. Uh, it's one that everybody in the state embraces. We're going to embrace it. I know it's going to be a little different because I know those kids personally in the other dugout. Nothing's going to ever change how I feel about them. But we're going to do everything we can at South Carolina uh, to beat them uh, when we play them. And I know they're going to be uh, and I know they're going to do the same. Next question to Matt Conley from on three. Hey, Monty, hope you're doing well, sir. Um, as you've had a few months to, to kind of reflect on your time at Clemson, just how do you kind of look back at, at that time and how do you kind of view that part of your coaching career? And then have you heard from anyone on the Clemson side of things since taking the job? It seems like the there's been a lot of support, um, at least on social media, that kind of stuff, just people really happy for you. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as my time to reflect, um, you know, over my time at Clemson uh, there for a couple months where where I didn't have a job and I, I had an I had a lot of time to think uh, at home, walking my dogs uh, three dot three times a day in the neighborhood because uh, I wasn't out on the road recruiting. Um, I think the biggest thing uh, that I keep coming back to is uh, I, I feel pretty good about how um, how I treated the players. Uh, the relationships that I have there with the people, I, I, I hope that the people that, that work at Clemson uh, feel, feel the same way as far as how I treated the people, our working relationships, my relationships with the players, uh, the fact that we had, uh, you know, a ton of academic success there. Um, and, uh, and look, you know, we, we had some good years, we had some bad years, uh, but, but all in all, uh, you know, I, I did the very best that I could. And, um, you know, we know what business we're in. Uh, you know, uh, Graham made a decision at the end of this season. We didn't make it to the postseason. And, and uh, you know, he made a decision to make a change. I respect it because I know the business that I signed up for. Uh, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I have, I have good relationships with, with, with everybody um, at Clemson, just like I have great relationships here at South Carolina. And it's simply my personality. I'm a big believer in treating people the way that I want to be treated. And showing respect to everybody because, uh, you know, that's just how I was raised. That's just who I am as a man. Life is too short to have grudges or be bitter. I'm not bitter about anything. I'm blessed to be at the University of South Carolina, just like I was blessed to be the head coach at Clemson. I was blessed to be the head coach at the College of Charleston. I mean, good Lord, in my coaching career, uh, you know, I've coached at, at three great schools and, and had great experiences all at all three of them. But there's no bitterness on my part. Uh, there's no ill will on my part. Um, I'm just excited about what I'm doing right here in 
now where my feet are. You know, I want to be great where my feet are. I want to do the very best uh, where I'm at right now. And I can't wait to, to get started today with our players here at the University of South Carolina. Next question to John Whittle from Vicksburg. Hey, Monty, good to see you back. I, I would assume you've got a, a, a great feeling, a, a great feel for the players on South Carolina's roster right now. How, how does that familiarity help? And, you know, what was uh, initial conversations like with uh, Dylan Brewer, Ricky Williams, Jonathan French? Yeah, the conversations with those guys were great. You know, again, uh, you know, those, those guys played for me uh, at, at Clemson. Um, you know, they were up and down in regards to their career. And I think they were looking to, to utilize the transfer portal for what it should be for, which is, you know, to create a new opportunity and a new beginning, right? Uh, so, you know, those guys were looking for an opportunity to go somewhere else um, to revive their careers. And, um, you know, they made the decision to transfer here to South Carolina, a great program. Um, and, uh, you know, when I got the job here, actually, I, as I was driving down, uh, I contacted, um, you know, Jonathan uh, and Dylan and just told them I was excited about uh, being able to coach him again. I uh, saw Ricky in person in our first team meeting, gave him a hug, told him I was excited about, you know, being with him again. So very, very positive conversations with all three guys. And, uh, you know, it's a new beginning for me too, right? Uh, just like those guys, they were looking for a new opportunity. And, uh, you know, and I have a new opportunity. So we're very similar in that regard. It's great to have some some people on the roster that I have relationships with and our relationships are, are very, very positive. Uh, as far as looking at the roster here, John, I can't give enough credit to Chad Kaye. He deserves a tremendous amount of, of credit um, along with Justin Parker. I know those two guys work tirelessly uh, once the season ended at trying to, uh, to bring in players that they felt like can make an immediate impact. Uh, and they brought in some really good ones, uh, some high quality arms, some high quality hitters, um, you know, the, the big thing that we have to do now is create a team and that cohesive unit uh, and the culture in the locker room um, and the togetherness that you need to fight for each other. Uh, and that can only be developed over time. Uh, so we and, and that's the biggest thing that we have to be able to do right now together is with so many new faces and new players that have played at other programs and have valuable experience and can bring those experiences here to South Carolina to be able to step on the field and compete right away. We still don't know each other very well. Uh, so. I think that's the main focus for me right now is just, and Mark, I know talking to Mark about it as well, is just uh, being able to take these new guys uh, with the guys that are returning and being able to create a team, a cohesive team that has an elite culture that's ready to compete uh, together. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's that got to be our main focus this fall. Next question to Gene Zapkoff from Post Courier. Hey, Monty, thanks for doing this. Um, you talked about, you know, what you learned from Coach Tome, and he didn't really uh, have to deal with the transfer portal. How much of that goes into your role as recruiting coordinator? And then, you know, you talked about the obvious goal, getting to Omaha for Coach Kingston. Is this uh, talent on this roster capable of Omaha next season, or how far away, if not? Yes, yeah, a great question. I, I think every year um, – you know, as far as the talent level uh, that we have, do we have the talent level to get to Omaha? That's certainly yet to be determined, right? I mean, I think the the main thing for us right now is taking a group of guys that have had a lot of success at, at other schools and a lot of returning pieces that have had you know, some success on the field for us here at South Carolina and blending those guys together uh, to create a team that can get to Omaha. Um, as far as, you know, dealing with the, the transfer portal, you're exactly right, Gene. I think you have to utilize the transfer portal for what you need for the next year. You know, if you feel like, if we feel like looking at this year's team that we're going to lose a lot of guys to the draft or to graduation and we need to plug some holes in the transfer portal, we certainly will do it. Um, we want to get to the point to where we feel like our freshman class and junior college transfers coming in are those guys. You know, we don't want to have a, a 20 man signing class and half of them are coming from the transfer portal, hopefully in the future. But look, if coming into next year, we're going to do what we have to do from a recruiting standpoint 
to maximize the roster and put us in a position to be successful. So that if that means that we have to hit the portal again hard next year because we're going to lose a lot of guys uh, and we don't feel like we have the pieces in place to put together a competitive roster that can make that type of run, then that's what we'll do. But we hope that we have at some point over as this thing gets going. Yeah, Money, you've obviously been – You've had your hand in a lot of great offenses from your time at South Carolina to Charleston to Clemson. Just when you look holistically at an offense, what does a good or great college baseball offense look like to you? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think the, the first key is is you, you have to maximize the strength of the of the players that you have. And I know that sounds very generic, but. You know, um, you know, the, one of the first things that we're going to talk about with the guys is. Um, is understanding what you are. You know, you're either a, you're either a buffalo or a deer, and uh, you know we don't want the buffaloes trying to be a, a deer, and we don't want the deer trying to be a buffalo. And it, it's really that simple. You know, if you're a big physical guy and you've got power, we want to embrace that. You know, one thing that you know people sometimes you know they don't they don't like guys swinging for the fences, and I understand that, right? Because it does lead to more strikeouts and pop ups and weak contact. But one thing we cannot defend is the home run. You can't defend the home run, and you can't defend the walk. That's the only two things in baseball you can't defend. So I'm big on plate discipline, and I'm big on maximizing power. I'm also big on guys that don't have power, don't need to be trying to hit for power. So if you're a deer and you can run and you can bunt and push and drag and hit and run and manipulate the bat and hit it all over the ballpark, we want you to be a deer. Uh, so it's really about trying to maximize what that player can do. One of the absolute fundamentals, though, is strike zone discipline. We have to be competitive in the strike zone and understand that chasing pitches out of the zone simply is not going to work in our offense. You know, our goal is to put together a lineup of guys that can get on base and score runs. Uh, it's all about scoring runs. However you score those runs doesn't matter, whether it's via the home run or via small ball. We got to score runs. Uh, so we're going to be very aggressive on the bases. Uh, you're going to see a team that ball and dirt, they're going to go. We're going to go first to third. We're going to score on doubles from first base. We're going to run the bases the right way. That's going to be a major, major priority for us. That's our special team, so to speak. Uh, but we're going to have tough, uh, tough at bats. Uh, discipline at bats. We're going to compete with two strikes. We're not going to give in. Um, you know, we're going to fight you. I can tell you that. I'm a blue collar guy. We believe in developing a blue collar mindset. And, uh, you know, that's going to be established from day one uh, as far as the type of offense that we're going to have. All right. Next question, uh, Michael and Nana. Um, yeah, Monty, just to piggyback off that, uh, I know Coach Kaye works primarily with hitters. I mean, is, is that going to be your main focus here as well? Or is it going to be a little bit of, of everything, a little more fluid than that? Yeah, I'm going to work with the hitters. I mean, my, pro my, my primary responsibility will be hitting coach. And uh, when we're on defense, I'll work with the outfielders. Uh, and I'll work with our base running. But my job also, because I have worked with catchers, I've worked with infielders, um, I'm going to assist Scott Wingo with the infielders. If he needs my help when they're doing defensive work, look, I'm going to go over there and help him. Uh, King's going to work with the catchers. Um, is a former pro catcher. Uh, but if I can assist him in any way uh, with working with the catchers, then, then I'm going to help him. If Parker needs some help uh, with the pitchers, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I can help him a whole lot, throw strikes work fast, change speeds, uh, get people out, um, you know, then, then I'm going to help him. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've been, I've done a lot of different things. I'm, I'm pretty well-rounded when it comes to what I can do on the field. Uh, but my main focus is going to be working with the hitters, base running and outfield play and assisting King in practice organization. Um, and, and then just, you know, away from the field, how does it feel just being back in the, in the city of Columbia? You know, does it feel similar to when you were here, in your last stint, you know, are your favorite restaurants here, you know, things like that. How, how does that feel? I guess just being back here in the city. Well, certainly, uh, you know, some things have changed. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, over time, like, uh, you know, just driving around the city, it's grown, it's certainly grown, but there still are, you know, plenty of, uh, you know, places that, that were here when I was here, golly, I guess it's been, uh, 
don't know, 16, 15 years. I don't know. It's been a while. Um, so uh, 14 years. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, look, you know, you go down to the Vista. Look, we've got a Chipotle, okay? <laughs> we, we've got a Chipotle that's three minutes from the field, you know, if, and we got a Starbucks. So, I mean, you know, if I got Starbucks and Chipotle, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, I don't know if we need too much more than that. And, um, but in, in, uh, in all seriousness, just getting to come to Founders Park every day. I mean, when you walk into this stadium, you pull in, you know, you pull in and, and you see the national championship, the dog pile on the back of the batter's eye, and then you pull into the gates uh, and you see, you know, the national championships and all the great players when you walk through the hallways, all the great players who have played here, an unbelievable facility. Uh, you walk out into the stands and, you know, it's going to, it holds 8,000 plus people. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just a great feeling to be able to come into this ballpark every day, knowing, you know, what I know about the tradition and the history of this program and being a part of it again. Uh, Alan Cole. Can you hear me this time? I can. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that first one. Um, kind of going back off of that. Um, you mentioned how when you got offered this job was kind of an immediate click for you. I think you used the word no brainer. Was it just the roster you liked? Was it being back somewhere you'd been before with the familiarity you were just talking about? Is it the tradition? What made this such an immediate click for you as opposed to head coaching jobs elsewhere or pro baseball, like you said? It's the University of South Carolina. I mean, it's pretty simple. It, it, look, I'm a big gut guy. I mean, I just, I just trust my gut. I mean, when somebody asks me, you know, would you be interested in this? Would you be interested in that? I'm. It, it doesn't take me a, a, a lot of time to make decisions. It's just a yes or a no. Um, and uh, for me, it was really that simple. I've been here. I know what this program is all about, and I know what this program can do. Um, it didn't necessarily have anything to do with the roster or, or anything like that. It's the University of South Carolina. I mean, you know, again, I was here for six years. I grew up 30 minutes from here. Um, so, I mean, it was a no brainer. It was an, it was a, it was an absolute yes, uh, that, you know, coming back and being a part of this program again, I have such a tremendous, uh, amount of respect for the program and, and, uh, my experiences here were just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so, um, you know, it, that's why it was a no brainer to come back. David Clanger. Monty, uh, being from Lugolf, are any of your family still over there? Any pals, anything like that? No, uh, no, my family is is no longer in Lugolf. Um, you know, my dad, like many men, um, my, my dad and my mom are both from South Carolina. My dad worked in textiles. Uh, so uh, we're actually from Spartanburg area originally. Uh, my mom and dad both grew up in a little mill town of Packlet, South Carolina. Uh, we moved uh, to Lugolf when I was in first grade. Uh, my dad got a job in textiles in Camden, South Carolina. So that's why Lugolf will always be home. Uh, but but uh, my dad and, and mom both moved, uh, so I don't, I don't have any family uh, in Lugolf, uh, but my best friend from childhood is still there, so I go over to see him and his wife and sons a lot, uh, and, and obviously know a lot of people uh, from growing up there, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it is, it will always be home uh, just because of the, the special uh, memories that I have of growing up in such a great community. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. All right. Gene Sapkoff. Money. Uh, you were playing at the college of Charleston when, uh, Brad Scott went from being head coach at South Carolina to an assistant coach at Clemson. And, uh, it, I, I think you probably followed the Gamecocks then. What did you think about that at the time? And, in any of your dealings in Clemson, South Carolina, did you ever cross paths with Mr. Scott and ask him what that experience was like for him? Well, I was certainly aware of it at the time, uh, you know, when all, when all of that happened. And, and, and yes, I did, I did uh, on several occasions um, get a chance to spend some time with Brad Scott and just a tremendous man. Uh, we never really talked about it, quite honestly. Typically, when we would run into each other, uh, you know, he would be on the sidelines before a football game and we would have recruits with us and I would get a chance to say hello to him and talk to him a little bit. We certainly uh, knew each other, uh, but I never actually got a chance to, uh, you know, have any conversations with him about the fact that, you know, he and I, I, I don't know if there's anybody else that's done it. Um, 
you know, the, but the fact that he and I had both worked at both Clemson uh, and the University of South Carolina, uh, never really got a chance to, to talk to him about that. John Little? Two, two questions for you, very different. Um, is there an ideal breakdown in the number of deer and buffalo that you have on your, your roster and, and in a lineup at a given time? And, and also, uh, have, have you been in any communication with the athletics director here? Did he play any kind of role in, in your decision to come? Well, as far as answering your first question, no, I, I, I want to see it with my own eyes. I, I'm a, I, I need to be able to assess the players uh, myself. Um, I've certainly heard a lot about the guys, uh, you know, from Coach Kaye. Got a chance to spend a day with him and talk to him. Uh, certainly have talked to King and Parker and Wingo. And, um, but I'd like to see it with my own eyes and kind of assess the skill set of the players. Uh, John, I will tell you, uh, you, you don't want to have too many of either. Uh, you don't want a lineup full of guys that are just runners, and you don't want a lineup full of guys that are just bangers. You know, you don't want a bunch of Buffalo in the lineup, you know, because power doesn't always play. Um, and you don't want a lineup full of speed either. You want guys that can do a little bit of both. I think the hardest teams to play typically are the teams that have a blend of both because the pitching coach in the other dugout and the manager in the other dugout, they have to adjust so much based on who's walking up to the plate. You know, when you got that guy that has great bat to ball skill and when he gets on base, you know, he's going to steal a bag and he can push and drag. It pulls the corner infielders in, puts pressure on the pitcher to be quick to the plate. He has to worry about that guy on the bases. And then you bring up that big thumper, you know, a guy that can juice a baseball out of the ballpark. Now he's got to really worry about the power element of that guy. So you want a blend of power and speed in the lineup, in my opinion, so that all your hitters aren't similar to pitch to. I think you also want a blend of left-handed and right-handed hitters. I don't like overly dominant, dominant right-handed or left-handed lineups. Uh, you know, feel like we need to have a good combination. Uh, we'll probably err on the side of left-handed hitters simply because you face more right-handed pitchers. But I think you want a, a, a blend of both. Uh, as far as conversations with Ray, uh, once I got a chance to talk to Mark, I talked to Mark. Mark was um, obviously who called me first, and we had, uh, you know, several conversations. I think, you know, once it was apparent that I was coming here, uh, you know, Ray and I have talked and, uh, and, but it's been very brief, you know, Ray's been pretty busy. I mean, he's had, you know, obviously, uh, you know, athletic director meetings and, you know, football season's coming up, uh, you know, so he's, you know, obviously he's, he's running the athletic department. He's got a lot of other things that he has to worry about, uh, but we have had, um, you know, a, a conversation or two and it's, and look, he's a mentor of mine. You know, I know he's the athletic director, but I still call him coach Tanner. I mean, I still call him Skip. Uh, when he texts me because he was the head skipper uh, when I was here. So, you know, our relationship goes back for, you know, 20 years now. Uh, so uh, it's great. It's always great to talk to Coach Tanner uh, just because, you know, he means so much to me and has meant so much to me in my career. Uh, but, uh, but Mark, you know, was, was obviously my, my first several conversations uh, in regards to coming back to South Carolina and, um, and so, yeah, but I have I have had a chance to talk to Coach Tanner a couple times. The final question to Pete Iacobelli. Monty, you've been a successful head coach. You say you're, you know, you want to bloom where you're planted right now. This is what you're going to be focused on. Do you still have some aspirations about being a head coach down the road? It's a great question. And, and, and one of the messages to our players is going to be to control what you can control. It's really that simple. We have to be able to control what we can control. Mentally tough people, people who are who are ultra successful, whether it's in business, uh, whether it's in academics, or whether it's as an athlete, um, they control what they can control. You know, they don't worry so much about things that are outside of their control. And that's how I am. If 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 I can't control it. I don't worry about it. So therefore, to answer your question, no, I don't think about it. You know, my job, again, is to control what I can control and that's be the very best recruiting coordinator, hitting coach, assistant coach. I know I, know I have the title of associate head coach, but um, my job is to serve Mark Kingston, do very best job I can to help him as a head coach. He's the leader of this program, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's going to be my primary focus, to serve the head coach, to serve the players, uh, to serve this program, to 
do the best job I can uh, to make our program successful. And I'm going to do that as long as they'll allow me to do it. Um, and, you know, obviously, like anybody, you're going to look at opportunities as they come about, if they come about. But if they don't, that's great. I'm going to continue to control what I can control and be the very best coach that I can be uh, in the role that I am in.